Welcome to Engaging with Self-Ligation, a series of short modules where topics surrounding self-ligation will be discussed. My name is Dr. Lisa Alvitro, and I have 25 years of clinical experience and over 15 in self-ligation. Today's topic will be arch development in self-ligation. Joining me is Jennifer McWinney with over 17 years of clinical experience. Arch development in self-ligation. So is there a difference in arch development with self-ligation? And I think there's a significant advantage of arch development in self-ligation. And as we take a look at some of these slides, I'd like to point out certain things to you. One, we can develop the arches and thin wires. So we're going to be selective with what's our arch wire and think about the form that we want to achieve. And if we look at this example here, you know, we've got a really thin arch wire. This is one of our 014 uh, uh, night tie wires, and we have it completely engaged. And if you look at really the arch development, you can see some of the expansion that we're getting, but we're not seeing a lot of tipping. And I think that's something you have to think about in arch development. Are you tipping or are you able to um, move the teeth in an upright position? You know, obviously there's limitations to how much arch development you want. And so you have to think about that when you're picking your arch wire size. Particularly if you're going to use a lot of night tie wires, you have to think of what that arch form where it currently is, how much expansion, um, how much development are you going to want to um, build into your treatment. And I think one of the really key points is when you're developing the arches is that you want to maintain an upright position of the post, particularly in the posterior teeth. Because if you start to see a lot of tipping, what happens is that that palatal cusp starts to hang down and then can produce uh, interferences and posterior occlusal interferences are something we really have to try to avoid um, as we establish or the occlusion. And if we take a look at, you know, how does this happen? I think this is a really nice example of we can see, you know, some of it obviously, yes, is uprighting of that posterior segment, but you can see that it doesn't op over upright. You don't see palatal cusps coming down. You tend to see a nice development. And here we have a combination of two arch wires. On the upper arch wire, we have a Clarity Ultra bracket. Um, because the patient was a little bit deep and he was a young adolescent, um, we use metal uh, or our smart clip bracket on the bottom, and you can see that we can coordinate the arches. And if we if we take a look at that arch development, look closely at where that arch wire lies. It lies toward the outer aspect. It's pushing against that door. Uh, unlike if you had a ligated system where you're going to be um, tying that or pushing it inward. So when you think about that arch development, you know, pick the arch wire size. Um, you're going to be able to develop the arches without a lot of posterior tipping. You know, As you upright those posterior segments, it's going to help create um, space within the arch for alignment. You can also see that at this patient, you know, we are disarticulated. Um, so to overcome that force of, force of occlusion, Another, I think, nice example of initial arch wire uh, development of the of not only alignment, but also starting that arch development. If you think if you look really close, you can see obviously this is still a um, this is a rectangular wire. At this time, it would have been a 16 by 22. And if you look real close, you can see it's pushing against the door that the void is actually back behind there. And you'll continue to fill that slot as treatment progresses. So you want to make sure that you pick the arch uh, arch wire width that you're going to stay with or modify uh, throughout treatment, and then really let it express itself to not only the dentition is aligned, but you're also seeing that transverse development as well. What do you do when you get the width? That's a really good question. I think that's something we overlook. When I get to that, what I consider an ideal arch width for that patient, we have to control it. You know, maybe if we chose too large of an arch wire, we don't want it to keep expanding because then they'd become overexpanded. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why sometimes when we're with a patient, I mean, often people think about chaining an arch wire, maybe when they're spacing, like, oh, she's trying to close space here. But often if I'm in a night tie wire and I like the expansion, I want to control that, that's when I'll ask you guys to go ahead and chain molar to molar because now we've got several forces working in that system. You have the arch wire, it's pushing on the door, it's expanding the upper, and now you have that, that chain that goes from molar to molar, and it has a constricting force on it. 
You know, another option is take out that arch form and then you can customize an arch form, like a steel or a beta. Sometimes you'll see me take out a beta wire mm -hmm. and and template it to that patient's arch form. Mm -hmm. So that's again, you have to think about not only expansion, when is that arch width achieved, and then how do you control it? Either by customizing an arch form, you know, possibly placing a chain um, to help control that arch form, because that is something important. But the advantage is you're going to see some really nice arch development very quickly in treatment, which will help you establish the occlusion, because it becomes really hard to start correcting an AP difference, like a class two or a class three relationship, if you don't have the mac if you don't have your arches coordinated and you don't have enough transverse dimension in the maxilla. Today's topic was arch development with self-ligation. There's other topics that will be available as part of this series.